Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. And of course, also for inviting me to speak at this workshop. It's uh, really an, an honor, I must say. Uh, so indeed, uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, run and tumble particles and more specifically about the ergodic measures and scaling limits of these run and tumble particles, since it's a relatively new model. So we start uh, kind of at the beginning. Um, and this is a, a joint work with uh, Frank Redig. He also introduced me to this uh, model. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, you can kind of guess what the overview will be. I will first introduce the model and say uh, also give some motivation on why we look at it. And then we look at the ergodic theory. And this is the point where we uh, will use a lot of uh, duality. So uh, that's why it also fits the workshop. Uh, <laughs> and uh, for the scaling limits, uh, we'll, we'll kind of see if we have time to get there. Um, but that uh, yeah, is also very interesting. Um, good. So let's uh, start with some uh, motivation. And uh, to talk about motivation, we have to go back uh, a year and a half ago when I was still a young and innocent little master student. And uh, I went to Frank and I said, okay, Frank, I uh, need uh, some kind of uh, project for my master thesis. And he uh, gave me uh, a model, namely the run and tumble uh, particle model. And he said, okay, run and tumble particles, these are active particles where the active component is determined by an internal state or energy which changes over time. And he then he sketched this little uh, uh, figure of a particle moving uh, to the right. And then after a while, the particle is like, okay, actually I wanna go to the left. So then it goes to the left and then uh, it wants to go to the right again, then it goes to the right and so on and so on. And so we see a particle running to the right and then tumbling to go to the left again. So that is uh, the funny name, uh, run and tumble particle. Uh, and when he told me this, I instantly fell in love with this model. I said, I want to look at this. And I told all my friends, I'm going to look at this model. They're called the run and tumble particles. It's really funny. Uh, but then they're like, okay, yeah, that sounds fun. But why do you look at it? And I had no idea. Uh, so I went back to Frank uh, and he gave me some motivation on why we actually look at this uh, model. Uh, the first one is that uh, there are actually organisms that show this run and tumble type of behavior. Uh, for example, the E. coli bacteria, uh, you can here see the movement of an E. coli bacteria where it runs to the right and then it changes its direction or it changes its internal state as we will call it to go here and then it will run here and so on. So this is really some run and tumble uh, movement. This is a bit of a biological motivation, but there's also a uh, motivation in physics, namely that it is a system that is out of equilibrium. We already saw an example of that today with uh, the first talk uh, today. Uh, this is really a hot topic in uh, physics, so that's why we also want to look at this model. And also more of a mathematical motivation is that there is a very natural extension to go from the model that I will introduce, which will be a Markov process, to a model that is actually non-Markovian. And from, that, uh, from the Markov process, we hope to say some things about this non-Markovian model, which I will introduce later on. So this is a bit the motivation. So now let's actually look at the model, uh, how we model this. Um, good. For our uh, single particle state space, uh, we will look at this kind of layered space. So uh, we define this V as ZD times S. Uh, so we get all the, okay, if, if D is equal to one, we get all these uh, Zs uh, for every uh, element in S, which we call the internal state, there is a layer. So, uh, and then we have a particle somewhere in this state space. For example, if it's in the top layer here, then it has a position, uh, which is defined, uh, which is determined by the place it has in Z and the internal state is then Sigma one. So these are the, this is the state space for a single run and tumble particle. And what is the dynamics of this uh, particle? Well, it has three different kinds of dynamics. The first one is uh, sim uh, simple symmetric random walk jumps. Uh, we still include these. These are kind of, uh, we include these jumps because this is a kind of a model of particles colliding with one another. So uh, we could still have that our uh, run and tumble particle collides with other particles. So it has these simple symmetric random walk jumps. Uh, but of course, we also add the active jumps uh, with the rate lambda sigma. So it depends on the layer what the rate will be. Uh, and it will be in the direction of its internal state. So for, say, for example, if we are on Z and the internal state is one, then the active jumps will jump to the right. And 
this, uh, the last uh, dynamic is the tumbling, and that is the changing of internal states. So, uh, yeah, no, okay, I will, I will explain it in a picture in a bit. Um, but these, uh, this is done with certain rates to go from uh, uh, internal state sigma to sigma prime. And these rates we assume to be irreducible and also symmetric, uh, where the last thing is more of a convenience uh, thing. Uh, we can also assume that uh, at least that the net flow between every layer is zero at every position, but let's just assume this for now. It's, it's way easier. Uh, good. So here are the dynamics kind of uh, in the picture. If we are uh, in, uh, if D is equal to one and S is equal to one and minus one, then as I said, we have the symmetric random jumps. Uh, we also have the active jumps. So if you're in the top layer, it only goes to the right in active jumps. And if you're in the bottom layer, it only goes to the left. And we can also change our layer. These are the dynamics in the picture form. Good. Uh, for uh, particle systems, it's also always nice to have some kind of graphical representation uh, when it comes to the time evolution. So therefore, uh, I have uh, made this uh, picture. Um, here we see that on every position in Z, there are two kind of uh, tracks, a blue track and a red track, and each of the track is uh, connected to an internal state. So in this case, the blue track is uh, connected to the internal state minus one and the red track to the internal state one. And then we add these Poisson uh, arrows. There they are. <laughs> uh, I kind of neglected the random walk jumps here because then it comes a becomes a mess, but we have the internal state arrow, uh, state jumps and also the active jump. So, uh, and what we then do, we just follow the arrows that we can find. And then we see uh, where eventually we'll, we'll end up. Uh, this picture actually always kind of reminds me of myself uh, in the following way. Uh, what happens a lot to me is that uh, I uh, go to grab something in a room. And so I go to that room and then I forget what I'm grabbing. And so I'm going back. And then here suddenly I remember what I'm grabbing. So I have to go back again. So if that also has ever happened to you, to you then you can call yourself a run and tumble particle. Um, but oh well. Good. So these are all the dynamics, of course, of a single particle. But we are actually interested in infinitely many of these particles. And because it is a new model, uh, we will only look at uh, independent particles. And later on, we can uh, extend this by uh, looking at also interactions. Um, OK, so then let's really define this model uh, completely. So we have a state space that will just be the natural numbers to the power, our state space for a single particle. So Zt times s. And for notation, I uh, denote the uh, eta t of v as the number of particles at any side v at time t. So yes? So I'm saying this, I guess, for mismatch, it's as symmetrical as the arrows also for the inactive jumps. Yeah. But it would be interesting to know if you do the same for some process for the these jumps, regardless of the internal state, or if each internal state has its own time jumps. Each internal state has their own uh, time jumps. Also for the symmetric. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. So then it really becomes a mess, <laughs> indeed, yeah, good. Um, so yeah, the generator, well, that will just be the generator of independent random walkers. So uh, we have uh, here the configuration where a particle has moved from a side V to another side W. Uh, and because they're independent, we multiply this by uh, at, uh, at the number of particles at a side V and some transition rates, which I already defined. Uh, they just define the dynamics that uh, I just discussed. Good, and also I'm a big fan of the semi-group notation. So I also will mostly be using this semi-group. Uh, good. All right, uh, that is the model that we're gonna look at. Um, and the first uh, problem uh, Funk and I uh, wanted to solve uh, was about ergodic theory. Namely, our goal was to uh, find all the ergodic measures uh, for this process. And then we found out that it was actually quite hard. So um, we uh, actually found a, uh, all the ergodic measures in a subset of the, uh, of the probability measures. And then uh, we said uh, that our goal was all along to find exactly those measures, and then we were done. Um, anyway, so, uh, but to do that, I will explain how we did that, and that will mostly use duality. So uh, we will start this uh, journey by looking at the duality uh, pro dual process. And the dual process will actually be the time inverted process. So I had this graphical representation earlier, 
And uh, now time is going down. So uh, we start here and we follow the arrows and we end up here. But for the time inverted process for a single particle, we will actually follow the exact same trajectory, but then in an upwards direction. And then you can think, okay, what is the uh, process that uh, belongs to these uh, dynamics? Well, the, uh, of course, as I said, the uh, internal state changes, they just happen symmetrically. If I would add any uh, uh, random walk jumps, then they're also symmetric. So that actually kind of stays the same. But what really changes is that the uh, active jumps now go in the opposite direction. So if we are in the blue track, then we can only go to the right. And if we are in the red track, then we only go to the left. So what exactly is this process? It's actually almost the same process, except that the active jumps are in the reverse direction. That will be our dual process. Okay, and uh, instead of looking at infinitely many of these uh, particles, we will only look at finitely many of these particles in the dual process. Yes. No, no. They, yes, I only show it for one uh, particle. But if you because if uh, because if they if you use the same representation, then they're not independent uh, anymore. So that uh, becomes a problem. So this was easier for one particle to show. <laughs> Good. Uh, so we only look at uh, finitely many uh, particles. And so this will be uh, our model now. The state space changes a little bit. Namely, uh, we only look uh, at the, the configurations where the number of particles, that's how you know this, is finite. Uh, the generator is almost exactly the same, but uh, here a plus has changed to a minus. Um, and that uh, signals that, okay, so uh, the active jumps are now in the opposite direction of the internal state. And for the semi-group, I uh, added these little heads to denote that this is really the, uh, the semi-group of the dual process. Good. Uh, well, okay, for a du duality result, we need the duality function. Well, what will these, this function be? It will be exactly the uh, product of the falling factorials. So we already saw this come by a couple of times, so I don't really have to explain a lot about them, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, the, there is this duality result. Uh, this is uh, the one that we're kind of used to uh, already, but this is here written in uh, semi-group terms where uh, the arrows point at uh, the um, process it, uh, it works on. Good. How do we prove this uh, result? Well, we can just do it uh, through generators, but I did this and I do not recommend this because it took me about a week to get all the calculations right. Um, and we actually found a way better way to actually prove this, but I can just say that this works. It does work. Good. Now, before we continue with our uh, story about run and tumble particles, I actually want to go a little bit more general because Funk and I uh, found a way more general result that, is, uh, that can be applied in uh, many other situations. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. And to do that, we have to start with something I will call the D-transform. So now we are in a general setting. So we have a duality function still on the, okay, uh, the space of finite configurations and the space of all configurations. The, the set might have changed a little bit, but anyway, it uh, doesn't matter. Anyway, and we have a probability measure. Then we define this D-transform of this probability measure mu as this function where we plug in uh, a configuration with finitely many particles. And it is basically uh, you know, the expectation of a duality function if we fix uh, a configuration psi. So it's also equal to this integral over here. Um, this uh, D transform will be the most important tool for our whole story. And uh, we start with giving a little, uh, uh, little uh, proposition about this uh, D transform. Namely, if we uh, have an invariant measure with respect to a process, okay, this is the same process as the run and tumble particle system, but this can also uh, be any other semi-group and this can be any other dual semi-group. Uh, but then the D transform is actually harmonic. So then this holds. So if we apply the dual semi-group to our uh, D transform, then nothing happens. And the proof of this uh, given duality is very, very easy. Namely, it's one line. Uh, we uh, just uh, use Fubini to get the uh, semi-group inside the integral. We can do this because it's actually just an expectation. Um, 
And uh, then we use duality, of course. And then because we have invariance, this semigroup disappears and we just end up with the D transform. So very nice little thing about the D transform, but this will be very useful uh, later on. Now, as I said before, uh, we wanted to characterize all the ergodic measures, but we couldn't find them all. We actually, uh, found, we actually had to look at uh, a subset of all the probability measures, namely the, what we call the tempered probability measures. And this is quite a technical definition, so we go through it uh, slowly. Uh, again, given the duality function, we say that the probability measure is tempered if it uh, satisfies three different th things. The first is kind of a, yeah, it's a condition about the, the D transform um, of mu. If we only uh, look at uh, particle, uh, if we only look at uh, configurations with at most n particles, uh, then this has to be finite for every n. So that's the first condition. The second condition is that uh, actually our probability measure needs to be determined by its D transform. So if two D transforms are uh, equal to one another, then actually the probability distributions are also equal to one another. And lastly, uh, we have this uh, vector space of uh, duality functions. If we fix uh, arc psi, uh, this vector space needs to be dense in L2 mu. Okay, as I said, a lot of technical things and how would you ever check if a measure is uh, tempered or not? Well, there is a very handy thing, namely if we are in the situation that this vector space is the set of multivariate polynomials and we have that mu is a product measure, then actually uh, the first condition implies the second condition and then applies the third condition. So, and the reason for this is very uh, much analysis based, but uh, it comes down that if, uh, if this is a space of uh, multivariate polynomials, what we get here is actually a moment problem. And if we have a product measure, then this moment problem also uniquely defines our measure. Uh, and to go from two to three, that, as I said, that's very technical, but you can just uh, take it from me that this holds. So that makes it very easy. If you only look at product measures, uh, then uh, we only have to check the first condition to see if a measure is tempered. And that is actually kind of doable. Uh, good. Now we can go to actually our main result. And the main result is uh, pretty long. So we'll also go through that a little bit slowly. Uh, we take a Markov process on a set of configuration uh, where G is any infinite countable set. So in our case, it was just D times S, but it can be any uh, infinite countable set. We take a dual process on the finite configurations where we also make an extra assumption, namely that the particles spread out over time. And this uh, can be, uh, yeah, this can be checked with the following. Well, this is, this is the definition of that. So if we have any two configurations and we let one of them evolve over time, then they become, well, it, it looks like it's independent, but what I mean is then uh, as time goes to infinity, they won't have any particles in common. So no matter the two configurations we start with, if one just evolves over time and in infinite time, they actually, those particles, they spread out towards infinity. That's basically what happens. And it's a very natural assumption to make, especially if, you will, if you're working with independent random walkers, uh, then it's easy, yes. Sorry? No, 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 no. Basically what this says, like uh, for example, if we uh, just put a Dirac measure here, then we want to say, okay, there uh, for every, okay, for every position, there shouldn't be any particles over there. Yeah. So here we don't evolve it over time. No. Good. Uh, okay, so that is about the dual process. We also need a duality function, which is of the following form where our function D is, uh, consists of non-negative uh, polynomials of degree K. This is also the case for our system. So we're still in, the, in our case. Okay, then we have the following two things. The first thing is that if we have an invariant tempered product measure, then it is ergodic. So that's the first thing. It's, uh, it's really nice. So we only have to check if a measure is invariant tempered and a product measure, and then we get er ergodicity for free. And the second thing, if there exists a successful coupling for the dual process, 
then the only ergodic tempered measures are the measures um, ut, for which uh, this is their d transform for some uh, constant uh, in uh, non negative constant theta. Okay, and there's actually one more thing which I didn't write down, but this is actually really important. Um, because from this, we can also conclude that our measure mu t must be a product measure. And then we can get kind of a circle, uh, namely if we, okay, if we have a successful coupling, then uh, the ergodic tempered measures are the measures okay, for which this holds, which are also product measures. Um, but if we have an invariant tempered product measure, then it's also ergodic. So basically, if we have a successful coupling, then we only have to look for the invariant tempered product measures for which did hold, this holds. And then we're done. Then we found all the ergodic tempered measures. Good. OK. Um, let's look a little bit at the idea of the proof of this uh, theorem. So let's first look at the, the first statement that I made, namely, if mu is an invariant uh, tempered product measure, then it is ergodic. Uh, how do we prove this? Well, we can actually prove an even stronger statement, uh, namely, if we have these things, then we can even prove that mu is mixing. And if we, uh, a measure is mixing, then it is also ergodic. Um, okay, and what is the definition of mixing? I've written it down here. Uh, basically, it comes down to uh, asymptotic independence of f and g if we apply our semigroup to it. Good. Okay, how do we prove that this holds then? That's also a good question. Well, we will first show the mixing property for our duality functions. Uh, so we start uh, plugging uh, two duality functions with psi and psi prime. And uh, of course, the first thing that we use is uh, duality. Very nice. Uh, so that uh, we get the st hat here instead of st. If we have that, uh, what we use then, then we can kind of use Fubini to get the st hat outside of the integral. And after we've done that, we also multiply by the uh, indicator function that psi t and psi prime don't have any particles in common. And of course, we get a rest term here, which is the same thing where uh, psi t and psi prime do have particles in common. But we know that this will go to this will vanish uh, as time goes to infinity. Good. Um, okay. What do we do then? Uh, then, uh, because psi t and psi prime don't have any particles in common, uh, and this d this d uh, of psi prime that only depends on the on the positions where psi prime has particles. And the excite uh, of xi t only depends on the positions where xi t has particles and mu is a product measure. We can get the uh, we can split up the integral into two parts. And then the first integral psi prime we can get that out of the expectation. So then we get this. Okay. After we've done that, then we're actually basically done. Uh, well, okay. There. Then uh, what we want? Well, we know that this vanishes to uh, towards uh, zero. Um, but we eventually want this, so we actually have to show that this converges to this, and then we are done. And well, the reason that that is true, well, we know that uh, the particles spread out to infinity here, so uh, this uh, will go to one, kind of. And uh, we also know that the uh, uh, the D transform, which is this, is also harmonic with respect to this uh, this expectation. So you can make it really rigorous that this does happen. I'm not going to do that here, but you can make it rigorous. Uh, good. So then we have uh, the mixing property. We have this uh, integral, and we can split it up into these two integrals, which is exactly what we want. And then we remember, because we assume that mu is tempered, that tempered meant also that uh, this, uh, this vector space of these duality functions are dense in L2, and therefore the rest just follows from a density argument. So we have proven uh, the first part. Good. Second part, how do we do that? Well, that is very uh, much more technical, so I'm not going to go into details there. But the existence of a su uh, successful coupling for the dual process actually implies that the harmonic functions, of which the D transform was one, uh, are actually functions of the number of particles in the configuration sign. So very informally, I can write down this. 
good. Then uh, we need to check uh, one thing. Yeah, well, okay. So we already know that the D transform is a function of the number of particles, which is really what we want. But we need this specific uh, function. And to show that something uh, is equal to such a specific function for some uh, non-negative uh, number theta, we uh, can act we all actually need to show this uh, that this holds so that uh, the d transform of the sum is equal to the product of the d transforms. Okay, and how do we do that? Well, I'm not going to go into uh, that, uh, but we can basically show that this is equal to uh, this limit over here, which I've written down. And that is also equal to, uh, this limit is also equal to this side. So this really helps us uh, to find this. Um, maybe a few words, okay. How to get the, the right side, we actually use uh, the Birkhoff ergodic theorem, which you can kind of recognize with the one over T and the integral from zero to T. Um, and to get the left side, we again use that the particles spread out over time. And then we can actually write the D of Xi prime and Xi T eventually. Uh, as just the D of Xi prime plus Xi T. But uh, I can give more details on that later. Uh, how am I actually looking for time? <laughs> how am I looking for time? Okay, perfect. Good. Okay, this was all the general theorem that we wanted. Now we actually prove our result uh, for uh, the run and tumble particles. So first of all, we need to find some measures uh, which are uh, let, let's first look at the uh, measures that we can find which are invariant. And we really want product measures and we also want them to be tempered. And a good place to start are actually the product puzzle measures. Because also in Stefan's talk, we saw that, uh, for, for example, symmetric random uh, independent random walkers, uh, the product puzzle measures are also reversible for the process. So this just seems like a good place to start. And we can actually, with our whole with the whole theory we built, we can actually fairly easily prove that the product measure, product puzzle measure measures uh, are tempered and invariant with respect to our process. Okay, how do we do this? Uh, first of all, we show that it's tempered. Well, to show that it's tempered, uh, it's actually very easy because the uh, D transform of uh, our measure mu rho, we can really just calculate. It's just product puzzle measure. So we can calculate this and we saw that they were equal to uh, rho to the power, uh, the number of particles in Xi. And then also the supremum of that is finite. And because it is a product measure, uh, we know that they are now tempered. And now note that because they are tempered, that also means that uh, the measure mu rho is the unique measure for which this is their uh, D transform. And we're gonna use this to show invariance, namely, if we now can show that the D transform of mu rho ST is equal to the D transform of mu rho, then this applies that mu rho ST is pure rho, and then we have invariance. So this is now our mission. And this is also not very easy, uh, not very hard, I mean, because we just write down the D transform of mu rho ST, uh, and we immediately, immediately use duality, of course, uh, because we have it. And uh, then uh, after that, so we, we end up uh, with this expression over here. Then I think, yeah, okay. So we can get the, uh, uh, the Markov semigroup outside of the integral, then we get this. And I fill in here now the, uh, the definition of the semigroup because here we see d mu rho psi t, but we also know that d mu rho of uh, any psi is equal to rho to the number of particles in psi. And now we use that we really have conservation of particles. So letting this uh, D transform evolve over time doesn't do anything. We still end up with rho to, uh, to the power, yeah, the number of particles in Xi T, but that is exactly the number of particles in Xi. And that is exactly the D transform of mu rho. And so now we are done. Very easy. <laughs> um, okay, I, I, I think I'm gonna go, okay. so. Okay, so we've proven that uh, these measures now are tempered and invariant, and they're also product measures. So by our theorem, they are now ergodic. And we, we also show that uh, this is their D transform. So what, uh, this is exactly also uh, this for the second part of the theorem. So only, the only thing we really have to show is now that there exists a su uh, successful coupling. And uh, to prove this, I, I will skip through it a little bit because I also want to talk a little bit about scaling limits. 
uh, it basically comes down to the following. Uh, we prove first successfully couple the internal states. So we make sure that the internal states get together at some time and then they stay together forever. We can do that. And after that, either the symmetric random walker, uh, symmetric random jumps do the trick. They can successfully couple the particles. And otherwise we have a way to also uh, do it with just the active jumps. But uh, if you want more details about it, please ask me uh, later. Uh, because I want to talk a little bit about scaling limits. Um, OK, so the, the problem with the scaling limits is uh, fairly easy for the process itself. So we want to go from this particle configuration to these densities. Well, we do this with the uh, proper rescaling uh, through the empirical measures. We rescale space with n. We rescale the weight with n, uh, 1 over n plus d, uh, n to the power d. And we also do a proper rescaling of time so that it all makes sense. And we eventually get a uh, system of PDEs. And uh, it's really nice. There's a diffusion because of the random walks. There's a drift because of uh, the, uh, the active jumps. And we also have that the uh, different uh, densities on every different layer, they interact with one another. So that all makes sense. Um, but this isn't really the, the problem we wanted to solve when we started uh, with the scaling limits. The real problem, and now comes uh, the non-Markovian system that I was talking about in the beginning, we are actually interested in the total density. So what is the total density? It is the number of particles at every position uh, in Z or ZD. Um, well, as I said, uh, we don't, uh, because uh, if you look at this process, this is no longer a Markov process because if I just look at this picture, I don't know uh, which particles have a tendency to move to the right and which to the left. So I need more information. Um, but as I said, we do know about the hydrodynamic limit of this system. So maybe we can say something about the hydrodynamic limit of this system. Well, in this very special case, we were able to do so, namely if we look at the case which we've been looking at the whole time, namely uh, S is equal to minus one and one, and all these things are just, uh, we turn them into constants, then this is the hydrodynamic limit of the system. But if we look at the sum and the difference, we get a new system. Uh, and this system we can really solve. So uh, it kind of reminds me of the telegraphers equation, and that has a way to go from, okay, the system to actually a closed equation for both uh, for both functions. So from this, we can actually find the hydrodynamic limit of the sum of, uh, of yeah, of the total density. But this, again, this is in a very, very special case. We cannot do it uh, for at least not, uh, uh, not yet for the general case, which is what we want to uh, see. Uh, and for the fluctuations, we looked at the same thing. So we uh, defined the fluctuations. Uh, and we found a result. Uh, don't look at it too long because it's full of abuses of notation. But anyway, it, what this result is, we have a, uh, a linear operator working on our, uh, on, our, uh, yeah, on our process Y. And then we have some very annoying noise, but it is just noise. So what is this process? It kind of looks like an orsan ulebeck process. Problem now is if you want to look at the total density that the sum of an orsan ulebeck process is not really easy to work with, not as much as uh, in the case of the hydrodynamic limit. Um, so that was kind of our goal to understand the total dense, uh, the fluctuations of the total density. Um, and again, for a very special case, if we actually neglect all the random walk jumps, we are able to find some result uh, for the sum and the, uh, the difference. And uh, yeah, because of course this uh, equation is very easy, uh, we can just uh, yeah solve this and fill it in into uh, this equation. And then uh, if we have this, then we actually also know Z. Um, but it is, it is still, uh, yeah, as I said, a very special case. We don't know anything general yet, but that is what we are working on. And that is actually where uh, we need all the help we can get. So if you know something, uh, please let us know. Uh, good. Uh, and then we're already uh, at the end, namely uh, some open problems that we still have and also some possible extensions to this model. Uh, well, the open problems that we have, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, characterized all the tempered ergodic measures. 
But then the question is, are there also non-tempered uh, ergodic measures? So that is the first open problem. We don't know yet. Uh, and we want to understand the scaling limits of the total density in more general cases. That is uh, what uh, Frank and I are working on right now. Uh, and then some possible extensions where we can look at the actual interactions, so not just independent particles, but uh, we can add some exclusion or inclusion interaction, or maybe multiple jumps that happen at the same time. And uh, also uh, some random particles on different environments. For example, we can add reservoirs to the system, which is also something we saw today. Um, and also some position dependent uh, internal state jumps. Um, now it's uh, interesting if we do this, then actually our successful coupling completely falls apart uh, as we made it because we would first coupled the uh, internal states. But if we do that, uh, while the while the changes of internal state depend on the positions, then yeah, it, 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 it's not independent of the position anymore, and so the we cannot really successfully couple first the internal states and then the rest. And lastly, uh, we want to look at uh, this process just on a whole random environment. Um, but I think that uh, that was it. I hope uh, you thought it was an interesting model, and uh, maybe you want to work uh, on something uh, with this later. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>